minus five, four, three, two, one, lift off. We have lift off. Two years ago, NASA commissioned me to create a story in honor of its 50th anniversary. Why would NASA commission a story to be told? NASA has movies and novels and documentaries. Let me tell a little story to answer why. Years ago, I was in Detroit, and a woman came up and said, I want to tell you about my work. She said, I'm, I'm working with children who are dying of leukemia. She said, I was working with Jonathan, 11 years old. Jonathan got very sick, and Jonathan said, when I die, cast my ashes on Lake Michigan. Well, Jonathan died, and his parents and Charlie, Jonathan's brother, five years old, the three of them went out on Lake Michigan. They had a nice old green boat with a motor and cast Jonathan's ashes. And Jonathan's mother said, look at that butterfly, colorful. That's Jonathan. They went out again. Mother said, oh. It is. It's a monarch. That, that's Jonathan. Then another time they were on the beach and Charlie, five years old, had a stick and Charlie is stirring up the sand and an old gray moth flew up. And Charlie said, look, that's Jonathan, but he's wearing a different shirt. <laughs> what an image for death, wearing a different shirt. I think that's why NASA commissioned, because stories are very human. And they're the voice of an ordinary person, and NASA wants everyone to know they have a voice there. I told that story on National Public Radio, and Jonathan's dad called, and he said, you know, when Charlie said he's wearing a different shirt, that was the beginning of our long process of healing, an image, an action, healing. Where did that image come from? Five-year-old boy, wearing a different shirt, Charlie. When we were all four and five, we were creating effortlessly, imagination pouring out. And as we grow older, our minds, I think, get more literal and more critical. And I think one way to free our minds and have imagination just come out is to tell a story about anything with a good listener. Tell a story and an image might appear. What you want to do when you tell a story is, this happened at work, let me tell you. And you want the listener to experience it, to feel it. So you might use a gesture or an expression or an image and you're not realizing it, but you're, you're creating. Can you craft a told story? I'm a storyteller and so that's my work. So with NASA, I, I had a thousand pages of interviews, scientists, engineers, astronauts. But then I began with a listener, just telling a little scene. And then with a listener, what I want is an appreciation. You know, what's alive? What caught your eye? What caught your ear? What was interesting? That's gold to me, gold. What I don't need, when I just first tell it, I don't need to, well, you know, the story's a little rough. Of course it's a little rough. I just tried it. Of course it's a little rough. It's like saying to a newborn baby, you're, you're nice, but you can't walk. <laughs> of course you can't walk. It's brand new. Appreciations are gold to me. My friend Doug Lipman has a wonderful book called The Storytelling Coach, and he talks about listening, appreciations, and suggestions in time. But he has this story about a a cellist who desperately wanted to meet Pablo Casals, the great master, and the young man felt, found himself at a party with the von Mendelssohns, a great party in Berlin, and there was Pablo Casals, and Casals said to the young cellist, come over, here, here, uh, play the Beethoven, play the Beethoven, the, uh, the D major sonata, and the young man was so nervous, he made a lot of mistakes and felt awful, and Casals said, bravo, 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 now, uh, the Schumann, the Schumann. Young fellow made more mistakes than it ever made. Ah, wonderful. Now, uh, on and on. The Bach, the Bach. At the end, ah, he hugged him. Good, good, magnifique. The young man left feeling humiliated. And he thought, Casal's a great master. He pretended to like me. Years went by. 
the two of them got together in Paris. They had dinner, and then they went off and they played duets together. And the young man now had the courage. He was well known to say, you know, that night, you probably don't remember, but you humiliated me. I, I, I did a terrible job. Cassad was furious. He came over to the child. Come over here. Cassad sat down. He said, the Beethoven. The Beethoven, didn't you use this fingering? I'd never seen that. It was good. It was good. And didn't you attack this, this passage with the up bow? It was fine. Casals went through every piece. And he said, that was all good. We have to leave it to the, to the ignorant and the stupid to just point out faults. We have to be glad for any bit of beauty. Casals knew about appreciations. Were well, they gold to me? And then I get a notebook and I dream on the story, tell it again. And when I'm ready, I get criticism. But only when the story's ready, when it's strong enough to take it. And know the criticism might be off, might be on. And then I'm unconsciously aware that stories are, are often dramatic because stories are people, place, and trouble. So many stories are like a clothesline. Here's the clothesline, but you hang images on it. Three quarters of the way along, you get this big heavy pole and you lift the clothesline up. So those images are building up because of trouble to a high point and then resolution. Suppose you were given an assignment to talk about leadership in the context of a moon landing. So you could decide, all right, I'll give a talk, no, I'll give a PowerPoint presentation, or I'll tell a story. I'll have the facts in there, but I may use my imagination to get into the story. So I'm going to tell you a bit of the long NASA story, just about nine or ten minutes, of a segment where I use this listener appreciation suggestions. The setting is 1961 when President Kennedy says we're going to send a man to the moon before the end of the decade. So here's the vision. Now the 99% of effort. Now it's July 1969. Nobody's landed on the moon. Can it happen? So this is the way I did that segment. I wanted Neil Armstrong to tell a story, so I invented a character he can tell it to a literary device. The idea is Armstrong is going into a nursing home to talk to an old man who's in a wheelchair, bent, uh, a retired admiral. Armstrong's known him for years, but the last few times, the old man has no idea who Armstrong is. And the last time Armstrong came, the old man didn't talk. The admiral's wife said, give it one more try. Here's the scene. Admiral Armstrong goes into the nursing home. Armstrong reporting for duty, sir. Admiral Armstrong reporting for duty, sir. Armstrong, Navy pilot, yes, sir. Combat duty, yes, sir. Korea, sir. Down to 500 feet in North Korea, my wing got sliced off, Admiral. I had to eject. The only reason I'm here, Admiral, the wind blew me into a Rice paddy instead of the sea. What's your latest duty? Moon, sir. Moon? Where's that? The moon, sir. The moon. <laughs> three of us, sir. Buzz Aldrin, Michael Collins, and myself. It took us three days. But then the question is, could we land on the moon? Never been done. So two of us, Admiral. Buzz Aldrin and I, we crawl, really, we float into a lunar module. On a module? What kind of plane is that? It's an unusual flying machine, so very small. Some of the walls are no thicker than a sheet of aluminum foil. It's like a cockpit, gauges, switches. It's a triangular window for me, triangular window buzz, circular window above us. So, Admiral, we're standing, harnessed to the floor. Why are standing? Two seats would weigh 600 pounds, less weight, less fuel. Or I should say, Admiral, just a couple of months before, Tom Stafford was 50,000 feet above the moon in a lunar module. Wait a minute, wait a minute. I know that name, Stafford. Stafford. 
Go to the academy? Yes, sir, Annapolis. Yeah. His mother, did you know that? She came to Oklahoma when she was six in a covered wagon. I didn't say, well, it's true. And she lived in a sawed house. So Stafford's 50,000 feet above the moon. Why didn't he land? His lunar module was too heavy, sir. Ours was the first light enough to land and hopefully get off. Sir so, Admiral, we get permission to undock. Now we're on our own, sir. This is a powered descent, which means a computer is flying this. We get down to 40,000 feet and we're lurching like, like a drunk, like a drunk, Admiral, because our radar kicked in and the computer disagrees. But the radar's right, so Buzz is trying to get the computer to accept that information, but we're lurching and the boo, boo. This is a master alarm, sir. This is serious. It could be an abort. Boo. Luckily, there's a young fellow down there in Houston. He says it's a go on that alarm. He's been through this in a simulation. And then, Admiral, the problem snowballed. Our computer is cutting out. Houston's got nothing. The screen's a blank. And we cut back in. They get just enough information to keep us going, sir. Down we go. Boop! Master alarm. Go on that alarm. We get down to 3,000 feet, sir. We're going slowly now, 48 miles an hour. We tilt over, and I can see the Sea of Tranquility. We're going to land, sir. We get down to 1,000 feet, and we are in trouble, sir. The computer's flying us blindly into our crater. The crater is big as a soccer field, sir, and it's surrounded by boulders. We're going to bust up, so I take over. I'm flying it. About time, Armstrong. I'm flying this. We call it the Eagle, sir. I get down to 220 feet, and I'm looking for a place to land. Houston knows nothing about this. I've got no time to tell them they know anything about the, the crater. Buzz has got no time. I've got no time. I find a place. No, it's no good. My heart is pounding, Admiral. 90 seconds of fuel left. Then I find a place, sir. I find a place. 60 seconds of fuel. 30 seconds of fuel left. We're 100 feet going down, Admiral, but my rocket exhaust is kicking up the dust and I can't see, sir. We're 50 feet from the moon, Admiral. And I don't know why, but the module is drifting back. And I'm wrestling with the sideways motion. And the contact light turned on. We're on the moon. I turned to Buzz. We haven't shaved in days. We've got these bubble helmets. We're on the moon. Houston, Tranquility Base here. The Eagle has landed. And? Well, Admiral, the plan called for us to go to sleep. Sleep, man, you're on the moon. <laughs> exactly, sir, we couldn't sleep. We asked permission to get out there. They said, fine. You can't imagine how long it takes. It's a checkoff list, and we got to put these oxygen packs on. So I'm doing that, Admiral, and I, I look up at the circular window. I think I'm going to see the stars and the blackness. And what I see way, way up there, Admiral, it's the Earth. To me, it looks like a silver doll. It's small, blue and white. It's beautiful. I look out the triangular window at the moon, and it's like a desert, but there's no atmosphere, so it's strangely clear. Then I put on these boots to give me traction, to, and I thought of what I might say when I stepped on the moon. You hadn't thought about it? I'm a pilot admiral. My job is to land and get off. It's not to say things. So finally, I'm ready to open the hatch. I wouldn't want to be on the moon. Why is that, sir? Mosquitoes. <laughs> no, Admiral, it's a vacuum. I made a joke. I made a joke. You got no sense of humor. I made a joke. <laughs> Go ahead. So I opened the hatch, Admiral, and I pulled the D-ring, and so the television camera's on, and hundreds of millions of people are watching. I have to back out with the oxygen pack. It's, it's awkward. I go down the ladder, and... The last rung is a three-foot jump. We thought the legs would collapse, Admiral, but we landed so gently they didn't, so I've got to jump. Each of the legs has this big round foot pad. It's like a shallow soup bowl. So I jump down to the foot pad, and I jump back up to make sure I can do it, and then back down to the foot pad. I'm holding on to the ladder. One of the scientists, Tommy Gold, he said, the moon dust could be a mile deep. I don't want to go down a mile. So I put one foot on the moon. It's solid. 
It's one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. Pretty dull. What would you have said, sir? Well, my wife liked Thoreau, Thoreau. Thoreau might have said, uh, I didn't come to change things. I came to wake the neighbors up. It would have been very good, Admiral, very good. <laughs> so now, Admiral, I put both hands on the landing gear, and I put my other foot on the moon, and I let go. I took guts. I took guts. It's like learning to walk again because of the one-six gravity, sir. You work from the balls of your feet, and then Buzz Aldrin came out. He called it magnificent desolation. I bet Aldrin wanted to step on the moon first. Yes, sir. Yeah, if I'd been with you, I would have slipped your Mickey. <laughs> Listen, I'm getting very tired. I'm going to have to have you go, but I'm glad you came. You're a fine man. One thing, though, yes, sir. Work on your sense of humor. Yes, sir. So that was a segment of the long story. And I had all these facts, but what I used was a listener. And the listener mysteriously drew out this admiral. So imagination was very helpful because, I tell this at a lot of the space centers, among other places, and the listeners think they know all about the landing, but they don't. So what I want to do is lead them in, surprise them. And then they listen. So listener, appreciations, they can be gold. And then when it's strong, when it's strong, then suggestions and criticism, but only when it's strong. And those suggestions can be invaluable. So I began telling you about Charlie, five-year-old Charlie, saying about the moth, he's wearing a different shirt, imagination. But all of that imagination still lives inside us. And telling stories sometimes brings it out. Thank you.